It was a bright summer day in 1906, and Dr. William C. Clark and his wife Harriet were driving slowly through a beautiful part of northwestern Connecticut called Litchfield County. Litchfield is a rural, very hilly area with lots of winding country roads, and the Clarks were there to try to scout out an area to build their second home. The couple lived full-time in New York City, where Dr. Clark was an oncologist, which is a cancer doctor, and he was also a professor at the Columbia College of Physicians and Surgeons. And while the Clarks' lives were very exciting and fulfilling in the city, they were also very hectic and chaotic, and so the reason they had settled on Litchfield as the place to look for a location for their second home is because it was the total opposite of the city. It was quiet, it was peaceful, it was perfect. And so as this couple from New York City drove along these winding backcountry roads, they eventually reached this beautiful covered wooden bridge. And after they drove across it, they got this view up onto this mountainside off to their right. And high up on this mountain was this huge shaded, beautiful forest. And they saw there was a road that appeared to kind of spider off and go into these woods. Now the couple had no idea what was up there, but it was just so beautiful and they were immediately so drawn to it. It, that they decided they would go check it out and see if maybe there was a spot for their second home in these woods. And so Dr. Clark took the car and he went up this access road and very quickly as they began climbing up this hillside, the road became very bumpy and overgrown. It was pretty obvious that not many cars were driving into these woods. And so before they even reached the tree line, Dr. Clark had to pull the car over and park it on the side of the road. And then he and Harriet got out and then on foot, they continued up towards the forest. And once the couple actually entered the forest, immediately the sunlight faded because the canopy over their heads was so thick and the air became cool and refreshing. And after walking for only a couple of minutes, the forest, which at first seemed very still and quiet, suddenly became alive. They could hear birds chirping and animals running around and insects buzzing. And then up ahead, they saw there was this field off to the side of the road that was full of all these wild apple trees growing in all different directions. And as they got closer, they saw there was just a deer right in the middle of the apple trees eating apples directly off the branches. And then just past all these apple trees, the couple began passing these huge, beautiful patches of roses and lilacs and bright yellow bitter tansy flowers that lined the road. And then before long, the couple was stepping over these babbling brooks and off in the distance, they could hear the sound of running water like fresh spring water coming down off the mountain. And then as the sun did begin to poke through the canopy above them, it almost looked like the forest was sparkling, literally. This forest was sitting on a hillside, and the hillside, which was made up of rock, had mica inside of it. And mica is a kind of mineral that when sunlight hits it, it almost looks like it's shimmering. And of course, there were the owls. As Dr. Clark and his wife walked farther and farther into this beautiful forest, they heard more and more owls hooting off in the distance. And to the Clarks, this made the forest feel enchanted. It was like the owls were personally greeting them. By the time the couple had turned around and begun heading back to their car, they had already made up their mind that they were going to build their second home in that forest. And so, after returning to their home in New York, they promptly put in the paperwork to purchase 1,000 acres inside of that Connecticut forest. And that forest had a name. It was called Dark Entry, and it was named that because it looked like from the outside, the forest was basically dark all the time. There was shade cast on it from mountains nearby, and then also the canopy inside of Dark Entry is exceptionally thick. At one time, there actually had been a town inside of Dark Entry Forest, However, all the people who had lived in that town were now all gone. The only remnants of this town were a couple of crumbling stone walls and a couple of home foundations that were scattered about the dark entry forest floor. The Clarks had seen some of these ruins as they walked along this overgrown path through the forest, but they weren't concerned. Instead, they felt like these ruins actually added some charm to the forest. After the land purchase was finalized, Dr. Clark began looking for local builders in Connecticut who could help him build this second home inside of Dark Entry Forest. But no matter how much money he offered these local Connecticut builders, they all said no. 
Now, none of them gave a straight answer to Dr. Clark about why they were turning him down. So Dr. Clark just kind of assumed that, you know, hey, this project is not huge. It's just one house and the forest is pretty isolated and hard to get to. And so he thought, you know, probably these builders think it's not worth the effort. But Dr. Clark was not discouraged. He decided he would just build the house himself. After all, he was a very handy, competent guy who had grown up on a farm in New Jersey, and so he knew how to build things. And so for the next several months, Dr. Clark would travel from New York City to Dark Entry Forest every weekend, and he would build this home. First, he cut down this massive swath of hemlock trees on this one flat patch of his land, and then with all this lumber he had cut down, he built his rustic two-story cabin on this flat part of his land. And then nearby on this hilltop, there was a freshwater spring at the top, and so he laid piping from the spring into his cabin so they could have fresh water. And then at the bottom of this nearby hill was this brook and Dr. Clark loved just standing and watching this brook because inside of it were all these trout that would dart all around. And so Dr. Clark built a swimming pool with beautiful mossy embankments right up against this brook so he could sit there and watch the fish. By Thanksgiving of that year, the cabin was done, and so Dr. Clark and his wife Harriet, they stayed at the cabin to celebrate the holiday. And as they were sitting in their swimming pool, watching the trout and listening to the owls hoot off in the distance, they both agreed that this second home was like their little piece of heaven. So every summer from there on out and every major holiday that they could manage it, the Clarks would travel to their home in Dark Entry Forest and they would swim and hike and relax and they'd watch the leaves on the mountainside turn from green to bright yellows and oranges and reds. It was perfect. That is, until 1918. That summer, the couple was in their second home in the forest when Dr. Clark was suddenly called back to New York to attend to a medical emergency. Harriet was very upset at the prospect of suddenly being left alone in this cabin in the middle of the forest by herself for who knows how many days. And so when she dropped her husband off at the nearby train platform, she made him promise that he would come back soon. And he said he would. And then Dr. Clark got on the train, it took off, and Harriet just stood there with her arms crossed, watching it as it chugged along off into the distance. From his comfortable seat on that train, Dr. Clark had no idea that his wife was about to endure a nightmare while he was gone. We've all been there. Your guests are on their way over to your house for your big New Year's Eve party, and right as they pull into your driveway, you realize you've overnogged your smoked chicken gallbladder eggnog. And so with minutes to spare, you leap out of the window, shattering the glass and cutting yourself up badly, and then you jog up to Canada and dive into Baffin Bay, and you jump on top of a narwhal, and after some intense underwater hand to flip a combat, you take its horn off its head, and you beat it to death. <laughs> <laughs> you take its horn and then you swim back to land and you jog back to your house and you leap in through a different window shattering the glass and then after you stand up you make your way into the kitchen and you whip up a quick narwhal horn iced soup right as your guests are walking through the front door crisis averted right wrong smoked chicken gallbladder eggnog and narwhal horn iced soup are both just gross. So your party was doomed either way. But you know what isn't gross? HelloFresh. HelloFresh is America's number one meal service that delivers actually good tasting food right to your doorstep. With over 35 recipes available every week, there is something to please everyone. Choose from family friendly, fit and wholesome, even veggie. Plus, you can easily customize your meals or sides, upgrading your proteins, or even adding a protein to your veggie meal. And if you're gonna be traveling this New Year's, HelloFresh can accommodate your schedule. You can change your preferences, delivery day, and your address in just a few clicks. So if you're ready to stop garnishing your holiday parties with trash food and drink, then sign up for HelloFresh today. To do that, go to HelloFresh.com and use code MrBallin21 for 21 free meals and free shipping. Again, go to HelloFresh.com and use code MrBallin21 for 21 free meals and free shipping. Okay, back to the story. When the Clarks bought their 1,000 acres in the Dark Entry Forest, they did virtually no research on the forest or the surrounding area. If they had, they very likely would not have purchased that land. 
You see, the town that used to be inside of the Dark Entry Forest, that was now just ruins, that the Clarks saw when they first walked around inside of the forest, was abandoned for a very specific reason. It was cursed. At least that's what the locals say. And in fact, that was the reason why no builders in the area were willing to go with Dr. Clark into the forest to go build his house, because they were too scared to go anywhere near the ruins of this cursed town. This town, which was known as Dudley Town, was first settled sometime in the 1740s. At first, it was just a couple of people and a couple of small structures, but pretty quickly, 30 families had moved in and it was a thriving little town. But as the 1700s came to a close, terrible things began to happen to residents of this town. First, there was the Carter family. They moved to Dudley Town in 1759, and shortly after arriving there, six members of their family all died suddenly from cholera. The remaining branch of the Carter family was so grief-stricken from their losses that they left Dudley Town and went to New York, where they resettled. But almost immediately after getting set up there, Native Americans raided their property and massacred them, and the three people that survived this massacre were three of the kids, and they were all kidnapped and taken away. In 1792, a Dudley resident named Hollister died suddenly. Now, we don't know if he fell off a roof or if he was murdered, no one really knows, but what we can agree on is that his untimely death happened in the home of a man named Tanner. And Tanner, following Hollister's death, suddenly just began obsessively talking about these strange creatures he was seeing out in the woods at night, kind of roaming around the dark entry forest. And he talked about it all the time and nobody listened to him. And eventually Tanner went insane and his daughter had to care for him for the rest of his life. And while Tanner was slowly losing his mind, his next door neighbor named Abel also began reporting that he was seeing weird creatures roaming around the tree line all around the town. And as Abel continued to report seeing these strange creatures lurking in the shadows, he too slowly went mad and had to be cared for until his death. In the early 1800s, a famous Revolutionary War hero, General Herman Swift, who lived in Dudley Town, lost his mind shortly after his wife was struck by lightning. And then in 1813, an unknown epidemic rolled through Dudley Town and killed many of its residents. After that, that, more and more residents of Dudley Town either died suddenly or died mysteriously, and also more and more residents began coming forward with stories about having seen these strange, shadowy creatures moving around the tree line at night. By about 1900, all the Dudley Town residents had either died or simply just left, abandoning their homes, except for one family. The Brophys. But in quick succession, the Brophy family's sheep all died, then the mother died of tuberculosis, then the two sons were accused of theft in a nearby town, and then they just disappeared, leaving one person, John Brophy, the father. But the Brophy family home burned to the ground, and so John, who was overcome with grief, just wandered off into the forest and was never heard from again. At that point, Dudley Town officially became a ghost town. No one lived there. And it was at that point in 1906 when Dr. Clark and Harriet had their beautiful summer's day walk through the forest and discovered where they wanted to build their second home. So fast forward back to 1918 and Dr. Clark, he's on his medical emergency leave to New York. It winds up being very quick. He's back on a train within 36 hours and he pulls into the station right near Dark Entry Forest and he's expecting to see Harriet waiting on the platform for him. But when the train rolled into the station, she wasn't there. Now, Dr. Clark was not a superstitious person, but for some reason, when he didn't see his wife there, he just felt like something was off. There's no reason she wouldn't have come out here to greet him. I mean, she was worried about being all alone in the cabin, and she knew he was going to be arriving at that moment. And so, feeling a little bit panicked, Dr. Clark left the train station and, on foot, made his way over to the dark entry forest. And when he got there and began walking on that overgrown road path that led to his house, 
immediately as soon as he was within the shade of the trees, he began hearing these owls hooting very loudly off in the distance. Now, normally, the sound of these owls hooting made him feel welcome, but this time he felt scared. He felt like something was wrong up ahead. And so he began jogging through the forest, and it's very dark, and all he can hear is the sound of these owls, and it's getting louder and louder and louder. And then finally, he reaches the clearing where his property is. And at this point, it's a cacophony of owls hooting practically right on top of him. And he looks up towards his house up on this hill, and he sees the front door is slightly open. And so now, with his heart racing, wondering what's going on with his wife, Dr. Clark runs up to his front porch, he gets to the door, and he flings it open the rest of the way. And then right before he stepped into his house, this sudden high-pitched noise began up on the second floor inside of his house. And it was so startling to Dr. Clark that he just froze where he was. And so suddenly it's so loud from the owls all around him and the woods behind him and whatever this noise is that he just stood there unsure what to do. And so as he's sitting there getting the courage up to go investigate his house, he realizes what this high-pitched noise is. It's the sound of maniacal, insane laughter coming from the second floor. Sensing his wife had to be in danger, the doctor charged up the nearby steps up to the second floor, and he could tell this laughter, this high-pitched laughter, was coming from the master bedroom. And so he ran down the short hallway, he got in front of the closed door that led into the master bedroom, he slowly opened it up, and there, in the back corner of his room, was his wife. She was on the ground, rolled up in a ball, facing the door, her hands were clenched in fists, her eyes were open and unblinking, and her mouth was open wider than was humanly possible. And as he's staring at his wife, wondering what's going on, he realizes this insane high-pitched laughter is coming from his wife. But it doesn't even look like it's coming out of her. Her chest is just heaving, her mouth is staying open, and the laughter is just coming out of her. And so the doctor just stood there watching his wife, who's staring directly at his eyes. And finally, he just got so scared, he turned and he ran. During Dr. Clark's 36 hours he was away in New York, something happened to his wife. We don't know what it was, but it caused her to lose her mind. The only thing she would talk about was the strange creatures she saw out in the forest. By some accounts, Harriet spent the rest of her life in a mental asylum. By other accounts, she went back with Dr. Clark to New York, where she took her life. Today, Dudley Town is not only still abandoned, but it is also illegal to visit. However, people do still sneak into Dudley Town and walk around the ruins, and many of them have reported feeling these pockets of cold air where there shouldn't be cold air, and also some others have said as they've been walking, they've felt phantom hands slap them and push them. Some have said they've taken photographs inside of the Dark Entry Forest near Dudley Town, and they've captured strange, shadowy figures that they couldn't see with their naked eye. The famous paranormal couple, Ed and Lorraine Warren, shot a special series in the 1970s inside of the Dark Entry Forest, and they declared the area around Dudley Town was demonically possessed. So that's going to do it. If you got something out of this episode and you haven't done this already. From 2000 to 2013, Cornelius Mike Anderson miraculously turned his life around. Growing up in a suburb of St. Louis, Missouri, Mike was a troubled young man that seemed destined for jail time. But something changed for him in the year 2000 when he was 23 years old. Suddenly he wanted to make the most out of his life. So he distanced himself from his old friends and he moved to a different suburb outside of St. Louis called Webster Groves. There he started a successful construction company. He got married, divorced, married again. He had three kids and became the father to a stepchild. He was very active in his community, volunteering countless hours at his church, as well as becoming a youth football coach. Anyone that met Mike after the year 2000 only had wonderful things to say about him. But Mike had a big secret about his past that he was just hoping never saw the light of day. Back in 1999, when Mike was 23 years old, he robbed a Burger King outside of St. Louis at gunpoint. He was arrested in the year 2000, convicted of armed robbery, and sentenced to 13 years in prison. Shortly after his conviction, he was out on bail pending the outcome of his appeal. But when his appeal was denied in May of 2002, Mike was expecting to go back to jail. And so he asked his lawyer, you know, what are the next steps? Because I'm out on bail. Do I go to the jail? Do, do they come to get me? And his lawyer said, oh no, they'll issue a warrant for your arrest. They will come to your house and they will take you to jail. So Mike got his affairs in order and he waited to go to jail. 
but no one ever showed up. And so days turned into weeks, turned into years, and no one ever took Mike to jail. Because it would turn out the state had made a clerical error and they believed Mike was already behind bars when he was actually just at his home. And in July of 2013, at the end of his original 13 year sentence, they went to go release him from prison. That's when they realized he had never been incarcerated. So eight US Marshals immediately went to his house and they arrested him and they brought him to jail and there was this huge public outcry that it was totally unjust that you're arresting him now because it's the state's fault that they did not bring him to jail. It's not Mike's fault. And Mike used that opportunity to become a totally changed man. And so after a number of appeals and this very public petition of people trying to get Mike out of jail, a judge finally took a closer look at Mike's case. And it would take this judge only 10 minutes to come to the conclusion that Mike was in fact a changed man and should not have to serve the rest of his sentence. And so although Mike was held for nine months after being rearrested, he was released and today he is a free man. The Trump family were by all accounts a normal, hardworking household. 51-year-old Mark Trump and his wife, 53-year-old Kobe Trump, had established a successful red current farm and earth moving business at their property in Sylvan, which is just outside of Melbourne. Their three adult children, which were 29-year-old Rihanna, 25-year-old Mitchell, and 22-year-old Ella, all lived and worked with them at the farm. But their seemingly ordinary lives would change forever on Monday, August 29th, 2016. That day, without any warning, the family dumped their passports, credit cards, and cell phones on the kitchen table and ran out the front door, leaving it unlocked. They hopped into Ella's car and drove north. 30 kilometers into their journey, and it was discovered that the son, Mitchell, still had his phone. And so the others yelled at him to throw it out the window. And so he did, he chucked his phone out the window. The family drove all day and night until they reached a motel in the New South Wales town of Bathurst, 800 kilometers away to the west of Sydney. The following morning, Mitchell decided he did not want to be a part of whatever it was they were doing, and so he abandoned his family and began heading home. The remaining four family members did not go after Mitchell. Instead, they just piled back in the car and drove east to a popular tourist destination called the Genelin Caves. It was there that the two daughters, Rihanna and Ella, decided that they also did not want to be a part of whatever it was they were doing, and so they snuck away from their parents and stole a car and began heading home. The parents, after realizing their daughters had now left, did nothing. They did not go after them. The two sisters drove south to the town of Goulburn where they called the police to report their parents missing. The story made its way into the media where the family was initially ridiculed for getting lost in the first place and getting completely separated in an area they should know well. This is their country. It's not a remote area. They were near big established towns the entire time. It just didn't make sense. But when police went to the Trump family farm back in Sylvan and they discovered the front door was unlocked, there were credit cards, passports, and phones on the table, suddenly it seemed like there was a lot more to this case than met the eye. And so as this strangeness came into focus in the media, people stopped ridiculing the family and began speculating what caused them to suddenly flee their house. Was it something in the water they were drinking? Was there chemicals on the farm that was screwing up their brain? Were they running from someone? Were they in debt? You know, what was it that caused this strange strange sudden departure. Back in Goldburn, after reporting their parents missing, Rihanna and Ella inexplicably separated at a gas station. Rihanna just climbed in the back of some utility truck and Ella hopped in the stolen vehicle and started driving home. Later that night, Ella would become the first Trump family member to be located by police when she arrived at the farm and police were waiting for her there. Mitchell would arrive back home the following morning after taking a series of trains to get there. Once Mitchell and Ella were reunited, they made a statement to the media outside of the family farm. And as you're looking at them, it's clear they're totally shell-shocked. They don't know what's happened. And they're trying to articulate why their family left in the first place and what they were doing and where they're going. And the best they could do was to say, well, there was a lot of pressure on our family and it was it was building up. And these things are just difficult to explain. And, and I don't really know what we were doing. Mitchell would say that there was a belief that people were after them. There was some paranoia there, but that paranoia was predominantly held by their parents. While Mitchell and Ella were certainly in a state of shock, they did seem mentally stable. 
The same could not be said for their sister, Rihanna. She was discovered by the driver of the truck she had snuck into after he had driven over an hour away. He had pulled over to check on something. He had gone around the back and then had the life scared out of him when he saw Rihanna just sitting there in a, what he called catatonic state. She didn't know her name. She didn't know where she was. She was just sitting there. Rihanna was taken to the Goldburn Hospital where she was put into their psychiatric unit. As media interest grew, the parents, Mark and Kobe, got back in their car up at the Genelin Caves and drove south towards Melbourne. A day later on Wednesday, the pair had driven 600 kilometers to the Victorian town of Wangaratta, where they too inexplicably separated. Kobe turned around and started heading north again by means which are still a mystery, and a day later was found 350 kilometers away in the town of Yas in a very agitated state. She was taken to a hospital there, but then transferred to the Goldburn Psychiatric Unit to be with her daughter, Rihanna. Mark stayed in Wangaratta, and he was there for several days, and during his time there, he was spotted by a young couple really aggressively tailgating them and then he was spotted again on another day fleeing from the car he had been driving. Finally on Saturday evening all of the Trump family members were accounted for when Mark was finally discovered sitting next to the road near the Wangaratta airport. He was questioned by police and then assessed by a mental health officer and then was released into the custody of his brother who was a police officer. And as they drove away Mark turned around and flipped off the photographers that had converged on the spot. He later released a more contrite statement apologizing for the hurt and concern that were caused by these events and he also paid respect to the police and the volunteers that went out looking for them. After the investigation the police determined that nobody was chasing this family. They were not in any danger. The family had also not taken any drugs. They were not in debt. They were not involved in any sort of religious cult and prior to this strange event the family had no history of mental health issues. After the dust had settled and the Trump family was just back at their farm going about their normal life every media outlet wanted wanted an interview with them to try to learn more about why this strange thing happened. But the family said, we're not doing interviews. We're not putting out any more statements. We just want to be left alone. And so as a result, all people could do was theorize. And the leading theory was that the Trump family was suffering from something called folly ado, which is a French term that means madness for two. And what happens is one person who is delusional can pass that delusion on to other people. And this typically only happens in very close-knit families or in very tight romantic relationships. While it's unclear which of the Tromps became psychotic first, doctors say it is clear at some point they were in a cycle of reinforcing each other's delusions if this folly ado theory is the right one. While the full reasons for why the Tromps went on this strange voyage will probably never be known, the police deemed it a family matter and did not press charges. In 2007, 35-year-old Eva Wisniewska was a member of the German national paragliding team. Over the previous two years, Eva had competed in 10 of the world's biggest paragliding competitions, and she had won six of them, making her the top female paraglider in the world. So coming into that year, Eva was very motivated to work extra hard to make sure she retained that title as world champion. On February 24th of that year, Ava was preparing her gear alongside 200 other paragliders on Mount Bora in New South Wales, Australia. This was Ava's last training opportunity before her first major competition of that year, which was scheduled for the next week. As they were getting ready to launch, one of the coaches walked in front of the group and made an announcement. He said storm clouds have been spotted to the north, but the forecast was a little bit ambiguous. It wasn't clear if the storm was gonna move over their training area or not. So it was up to each of the paragliders if they still wanted to launch that day and risk the bad weather. Ava, who was really eager to get this training flight in, looked at the sky and saw that it was pretty gray, but decided that she was gonna do it. Worst case scenario, she would have to cut it short. 
the rest of the German national team, they didn't want to take the risk. And so they stayed grounded that day. Ava took a little bit longer preparing her gear. So by the time she was lining up on the cliff, she was only one of a handful of people that remained. And so strapped into her glider, she took a good run forward and launched herself up into the air. On the ground, the rest of the German national team followed in a van to track her progress and checked in with her from time to time with their radio. The first part of Ava's journey was incredibly calm. She followed the ridge line from Mount Bora for 12 miles until it ended. At that point, she entered into the skies over the vast savanna. As her GPS and tracking log ticked, tracking her progress, two large thunderstorm clouds appeared in front of her, one larger than the other. The vast majority of the other paragliders that had launched that day had launched ahead of Ava. And so when these clouds appeared, they had already passed that section. And so they didn't need to contend with the storm. As for Ava and the other two people she was with, which was an Austrian team member and a Chinese team member, they had a decision to make. They could either immediately ground their flight to avoid the storm, or they could attempt to dodge it. They chose the latter. They knew it was too dangerous to try to fly underneath these clouds because of something called updraft. At the beginning of storms, warm air is sucked up from the ground up into these clouds, and a paraglider, if they get caught in that, can get sucked up with the air into the storm. And so Ava and the other two paragliders began aggressively flying around the outside of these clouds when all of a sudden the storm completely changed. The big cloud overtook the small cloud, creating this 12 mile wide cumulonimbus cloud that now all three paragliders were stuck inside of. Any updraft is dangerous to a paraglider, but the updraft of a cumulonimbus Nimbus cloud is famously dangerous because it's extremely powerful and it lasts for over an hour. The Austrian man was able to pull down on one toggle, point his feet, and begin spiraling all the way out of the grasp of this updraft. And he said he turned to look at the other two and he didn't see the Chinese man, but he did see Ava and she was desperately trying to do what he was doing and spiral down, but she was clearly caught in the updraft and he watched her get pulled up into the black cloud out of view. By the time the Austrian man hit the ground, he would say it had become the worst thunderstorm he had ever seen with huge huge hail balls hitting the ground all around him. He took one more look up and he didn't see the Chinese man. He didn't see Ava anywhere. And he took off running for a barn to seek shelter. And when he was there, he pulled out his radio and he alerted the other teams of this emergency. Inside the cloud, Ava was hurtling up like a rocket. The storm was lifting her at a rate of 60 feet per second. There was nothing she could do to get out of this wind tunnel. Ava knew she was getting pulled towards the storm's eye in its vicious center because of the immense claps of thunder that just kept getting louder and louder and it also kept getting darker and darker all around her in fact it was pitch black except for the occasional flash of lightning that came very close to electrocuting her as she desperately tried to keep her glider stable she was able to place a radio call down to her team on the ground but all she could say was i can't see anything before it cut out and at some point ava reached the eye of the storm where it's pitch black and the temperatures are freezing and hail balls the size of oranges are pelting her left and right and the updraft kept pulling her her higher and higher and higher until she passed out from a lack of oxygen. And at some point, this updraft actually shot her up and out of the cloud. And while this meant she was out of the storm, she was now in air that was 50 degrees below zero which meant everything, her face, her gloves, her clothes, the wings of her glider, everything completely froze. And to make matters worse, at the altitude she was at, there was almost no oxygen and she did not have a breathing apparatus. So by all accounts, Ava should be dead. But somehow, she didn't die. She just kept floating around above the storm cloud for 45 minutes. And then something happened. The ice on one side of the glider broke off, causing it to collapse, throwing her into a deadly free fall and she's not in control she's still unconscious and she starts barreling back towards the ground like gravity has been turned back on again going straight through the storm all over again and so through the storm going at 90 feet per second she clears the storm and then right after getting out from underneath it her glider miraculously just opens back up again and the jerking motion of her suddenly stopping her free fall jolted her awake and so she's looking around totally confused as she's gradually regaining consciousness and she's taking stock of where she is and she's still in the storm cloud but right at the bottom of it but luckily the updraft had stopped and so she was steady and she was able to reach up and grab her toggles and she was able to fly herself down to the ground and crash land and then she curled into a ball grabbed her radio and she called her team when they heard her voice they could not believe she was alive because the other paraglider that got sucked up by the updraft the guy from the chinese national
national team, he unfortunately was struck by lightning and was killed. And so they were anticipating finding out that Ava had been struck by lightning as well. But Ava had not just survived. When they brought her to the hospital, they discovered that virtually nothing was wrong with her. She had some pretty bad bruises and cuts from the hail, and she had a little bit of frostbite on her face, but it was treatable. And so the same day she was brought in, they discharged her. After leaving the hospital, she and her teammates went back to the launch site so she could collect her gear. And when they got there, she looked at her GPS and the GPS had been tracking her entire flight the entire time she was up in that cloud. And she showed her teammates what it said and they literally couldn't believe it. The screen showed she had reached an altitude of 32,634 feet, which to put this in perspective is the same altitude you fly at inside of a commercial jet. So imagine being outside of your plane in the middle of a flight and that's how high she was. Another reference point is she was approximately 4,000 feet high higher than the summit of Mount Everest. No human being had ever been that high, unprotected, and lived to tell the tale. 